Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Miller Center. Uh, today is a, as my kids say, happy sad day. Um, I'll start with the sad news. I'm sure you saw the passing of Jim Lehrer. Um, as many of you may know, Jim Lehrer had been a member of our governing council for the last uh, four years uh, or so. We've posted a full in memoriam on our website, which I encourage you to visit. Uh, and we will be honoring Jim at a future event. But I want to encourage everyone to visit the in memoriam because on there you will see Jim on this stage in two different videos. Um, the first, he appeared in an American Forum event. He spoke about the revolutionary and troubling challenges and uh, developments in American media. And that event was in 2016. Um, the second uh, is not one that anyone here saw, except for maybe one or two people on our technical team. Uh, Jim came and sat on this stage for two and a half hours and did an oral history with Barbara Perry and me, uh, which we are releasing for the first time, where he talked about his coverage of uh, the American president for over 50 years. You may not know this, but Jim was in Dallas as a news reporter on November 22nd, 1963, when President Kennedy was killed. Um, and he covered every president since through Barack Obama. And that uh, interview took place in the summer of 2015 in late July, about a week before the first Republican debate where much to the surprise of almost everyone in the room uh, at a lunch afterwards, Jim predicted that Donald Trump could win the Republican nomination. Um, so we'll go from that prophecy to the exploration of a true American prophet. Uh, today, we are thrilled and honored to have with us David Blight, who in 2019 won the Pulitzer Prize in History for Frederick Douglass, American prophet. David is a renowned historian who is considered one of the nation's foremost authorities on the Civil War, its aftermath, and its legacy. And in his work, uh, he, was pre he has presented a new way of understanding how American society grappled with the war and its aftermath, arguing that its racist underpinnings were largely ignored and have left behind a legacy of conflict. Uh, once a high school teacher in his hometown, David is now a professor in American history at Yale University and is director of Yale's Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. He is a frequent book reviewer for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Boston Globe, Slate.com, and other newspapers. He has written many articles on abolitionism, American historical memory, African-American intellectual and cultural history. He's one of the authors of a best-selling college American history textbook, A People and a Nation. Uh, and he's a contributor to the anthology, Our American Story, where alongside other leading thinkers from across the political spectrum, He's contemplated whether a new, more unified American story, a composite nationality, can be achieved. His lectures in the US and around the world on the Civil War and Reconstruction, on race relations, on Douglas, Dubois, and the broader problems in American public history and American historical memory are extraordinary. In describing Frederick Douglass, he has used the word hero, perhaps in reference to the narrative and its reverence. Yet this description also encourages us to consider the kind of self-determination that is required to free oneself from the effects of tragic circumstance. We want our heroes to be uncomplicated, to be constant in their politics and their ideals. We want to remember Lincoln as the great emancipator, as the moral man in an amoral world, assuring us we could do better. Um, and like Lincoln, Douglas's legacy is not uncomplicated. Blight's meticulously researched biography explores Douglas's paradoxical qualities, his complexities, the challenges of his family relationship, his achievements, uh, and his personal shortcomings. He portrays Douglas as a hero, um, as one of the greatest American heroes, while also revealing his weaknesses and showing him to be a human being who still deserves the word prophet. Since its release in 2018, Prophet of Freedom has received nine awards, among them, which, um, among them are the Pulitzer Prize in History, the Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize. Um, it has been optioned by Higher Ground Productions and Netflix for a uh, projected feature film. 
Uh, the work has been praised in particular for its demonstration of the scope of Douglas's influence through deep research on his writings, his intellectual evolution, and his relationships. Um, it is cinematic and engaging and a tour de force portrait of a man in full. Um, so today David joins us to discuss his book and the larger issues of race in America as part of UVA's 2020 community MLK celebration. And for that, I'm particularly thankful for Alfred Reeves, who is the Miller Center's uh, member of the MLK uh, Community Celebration Task Force, as well as Christina and the entire events team who has uh, worked to put this together. Uh, we are joined today in our conversation to follow David's opening remarks by Larisha Hawkins, who is a scholar, author, and speaker. After receiving her BA from Rice University and her MPA and PhD from the University of Oklahoma, she worked in federal programs administered by the state government, um, such as the Social Security Disability Program and the Community Development Block Grant. In pursuit of her PhD, she was awarded a Miller Center uh, National Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship. So it's always great to have Larisha back with us. She joined the college, the faculty at Wheaton College in 2007, was tenured and promoted to associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations. She was the first African-American woman to have been tenured at Wheaton College since its founding in 1816, 1860. Today, Professor Hawkins works in our own Department of Politics and Religious Studies, serving as on the faculty in uh, Religion, Race, and the Democracy Lab. She's a co-convener of the Religion and Its Publics Project of the Henry Luce Foundation and is a faculty fellow on Race, Faith, and Culture Project at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Culture. Her work focuses on black theology and its relationship to political rhetoric and black political agendas like those of the Congressional Black Caucus and the NAACP. She's also an activist who continues to speak nationally and internationally on her continued acts of embodied solidarity. So David will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then Larisha and I will enjoy a conversation with him before turning it over to you. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming David Flight. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you all for coming out Friday afternoon. Uh, and thank you, Professor Hawkins, for joining us. I really want to keep this under 20 minutes if possible because I'd really rather have a conversation. I've given now in the hundreds of book talks, but my favorite events are always when I get to discuss this book with someone else, especially when I know they've read it. <laughs> Which is a little scary. They've actually read it. Um, don't hold your breath about that movie project. They, those things take a long time. But uh, it's at the screenwriter stage, so it's, you know, step one. Um, I want to quickly say, as I do every time I speak on this book, that I owe this book, and it would simply never have been written uh, without it, uh, to a man named Walter Evans. If you've actually read the book, you may have seen this in the introduction. I had no intention of writing a full life of Douglas. Uh, at this stage in my life. I did my first book on Douglas. It was my dissertation in grad school. I edited the f editions of his first two autobiographies. I wrote essays on Douglas. Uh, Douglas was some part, at least, of virtually every other book I've ever written. But I wasn't going to take, I wasn't going to tackle a full life of Douglas. It, it was too big, too hard. Why would I? Until about 12 years ago, I went to Savannah, Georgia, you may think of all places, uh, to give another talk on Douglas's narrative, his autobiography, to middle and high school teachers, which I love to do. And to make that long story short, uh, my host there, which was the Georgia Historical Society, said there's a local gentleman here in Savannah, he's a collector, he'd like to meet you and have lunch. And I apparently said something like, I guess so, <laughs> which was not the appropriate answer. And that day I met the most extraordinary man. Walter Evans is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, went north for his higher education. Howard University is an undergrad. 
Went to the University of Michigan Medical School and then practiced as a general surgeon for almost 35 years in Detroit, which immediately gave us something in common because I grew up in Flint, just up the road. But Walter's great passion in life, and has been since the 1980s, was collecting African-American manuscripts, rare books, and art. In fact, his art collection is far more important even than his manuscripts. Uh, that's another story. But that day he took me over to his house, which if you know Savannah, is one of those beautiful four-story brownstones near Forsyth Park. He got out on his dining room table a major portion of his Douglas collection, and it was one of those crazy moments of wild, blind luck by a historian. Uh, I did not, on the, you know, on the site, decide, ah, it's my destiny to write this biography of Douglas, road to Damascus moment. No. <laughs> I was intimidated. I was terrified. I said, I, I, I'm not going to do this. I only had about two hours, I think, that first day, but I realized quickly this is an amazing collection, and I took at least six months to figure out what I should do. My agent actually figured out what I should do. She kept saying, you're doing this biography. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Finally, I decided, yeah, all right, and because if I don't, somebody else will. Never underestimate competition as a motivator. Uh, <laughs> so I spent uh, at least six Yale spring breaks in Savannah, which is tough duty in the middle of March during Azalea time, uh, and a lot of other weeks uh, working on Linda and Walter Evans's dining room table, which is still the coolest archive I've ever worked. I, I love archives. I've been in some great archives, but there's none better than their dining room table. The reason that collection is so important is because at the core of it are nine very large Douglas family scrapbooks that were kept by principally two of Douglas's uh, sons over the last 30 to 35 years of their father's life. It includes thousands and thousands of newspaper clippings that you could never otherwise access, even in this day of digitization, from all kinds of small town newspapers. Wherever Mr. D went to speak, a clipping came back, or almost anywhere. And it turns out the family even hired a clipping service in the early 1880s that I didn't even know existed in the 19th century. It was called the American Bureau. Who knew? Um, and it includes a load of other family material. But what it opened up, uh, and, and Bill in some ways referred to this, what it opened up was the last third of Douglass's life. If Americans tend to know Frederick Douglass at all, and there's still millions who know nothing about him, they tend to know the young Douglass, the heroic Douglass, the, the slave Douglass, the escaped slave Douglass, the one who writes that magical first narrative and he, when he's only 27 years old, who becomes this in, almost incomparable orator even in his 20s, certainly in his 30s by the 1850s. They may know, you know, that he meets Lincoln a few times and he has some role saying important things at the time of the Civil War. But most people don't know the older Douglass. He's an older man. He's aging. He's becoming a patriarch of a huge extended family. It turns out that's fascinating, as some of you may know. Uh, four surviving adult children, 21 grandchildren, at least three fictive siblings at various times who adopted him or he adopted them. And in his later years, always a variety of other hangers-on around Douglass because he was Douglas, and because some of them thought he had a lot of money. Uh, but the older Douglas is also, uh, you know, we've dismissed him at times as out of touch. Uh, becomes a bu government bureaucrat. He gets three appointments in the federal government, becomes recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia. That doesn't sound very sexy, being recorder of deeds, except it paid him a salary and uh, gave him a more than a foothold inside the Republican Party. It turns out growing old, whether it's on the personal side or the public side of a great figure's life, uh, 
can be just as fascinating as the young hero. And the Evans collection made possible understanding the older Douglas as never before. I was not the first to see Walter's collection, but I was the first to use it. There now are a number of other Douglas scholars who've gone to Savannah, gone through Walter's initiations, you know, genuflected properly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm more than happy to say that collection is about 90% certain. It's very close to landing at the Beinecke Library at Yale. But Walter's a hell of a businessman. <laughs> and uh, the offer they made him five years ago is extraordinary. I can't tell you what it was, but it was an extraordinary offer for this collection. He didn't accept it. He waited till this book came out. <laughs> And, uh, and it's dedicated to he and his wife, him and his wife. And uh, the offer has now doubled. <laughs> and he still hasn't accepted officially. Anyway, anyway, the point of all that is blind good luck is sometimes the best thing you can encounter in research. Um, it's, um, you know, manna from heaven. I, I could tell you much more about that collection, but I won't. I want to say a few things about Douglas and why he's important, especially at a center for the presidency. And I should say, too, I think every historian um, aspires to be able to speak at the Miller Center. I've known many colleagues and friends who have, and I don't even study the presidency. So <laughs> I don't know how I got here except by... Mr. D, I follow him wherever he takes me. Um, so I want to take us to a particular presidential moment in Douglas's life. Uh, and I actually cleared this with Bill. It, it, it was cleared. I... <laughs> Douglas has, not, it's not one of the meetings with Lincoln. It's his encounter in eight, uh, the winter of 1866 with Andrew Johnson. Those of you who know your American history, which is I'm sure all of you, know that at this moment, winter 66, the southern states had been sort of rapidly, supposedly reconstruction, or reconstructed under Johnson's extraordinarily lenient plan, and were ready to come back into the Union in December 65. Only, what, eight months after Appomattox. And the Republicans, put up the halt sign on the door of the Capitol and said, no, Alexander H. Stevens, you may not become a senator from Georgia. You were the vice president of the Confederacy. Sorry. They pulled, called a halt to Johnson's rapid plan of reconstruction, and they put together a thing called the Joint Committee on Reconstruction. Fifteen members, 12 of them Republican, three Democrats. Stacked. Uh, and they held enormous hearings for many weeks. The uh, United States Congress had never done anything like this before. Huge hearings on what to do about Reconstruction. They had uh, 144 odd witnesses, including Robert E. Lee himself, and lots of Union soldiers and Freedmen's Bureau agents from the South to come and tell Congress what's actually happening on the ground in the South. In the midst of those hearings, Frederick Douglass, without any invitation, manages to take a delegation of 12 other black leaders. His, his sort of partner in this was a man named George T. Downing, who was an important man about town in Washington, D.C., an African-American who was a caterer, uh, a restaurateur early in his life, and now a he, was, he ran the uh, uh, restaurant in the U.S. Capitol. So Downing had connections in the government. Douglas took his son, oldest son, Lewis, and this 10 or so other black leaders to the White House and just demanded a meeting with Andrew Johnson. Demanded to confront him about issues of civil rights, the right to vote. Johnson didn't want to meet with him, but there they were. So he agreed to. They met for slightly more than an hour. Uh, they, they, they prepared a whole statement they wanted to, to read to Johnson about... <clears throat> 
their right to vote, their right to civil liberties, their right to protection in the South. Um, instead, Johnson cut them off and gave a 45-minute speech at them. And in that speech, Johnson humiliated them, insulted them. He said, among other things, yes, he was willing to be the Moses for the freed people if they needed one. That's humility. Less than a year after Appomattox, he said, quote, the feelings of my own heart have been for the colored man. I have owned slaves and bought slaves, but I never sold one. Now, okay, that was how they started. Then Johnson complained that in his relationship with blacks during his life in Tennessee and North Carolina, quote, I have been their slave instead of their being mine. Some even followed me here, while others are occupying my property, but with my consent. I have been their slave more than they have been mine. He's saying this to former slaves. He then said, and this was a jab directly at Douglas, that he did not, quote, like being arraigned by someone who can get up handsomely rounded periods and deal in rhetoric and talk about abstract ideas of liberty. Douglas was known, of course, for his enormous eloquence. And he, could, he could get up some rhetoric. Then he went on to say that if you keep ad advocating for all these rights, votes and so on, America will have nothing but race war. Then he suggested that the only real answer in the wake of the emancipation of the slaves, which, which he can't change, was again the idea of removal from the country, colonization of black people out of the United States. Why don't you just lead a, a new scheme to colonize yourselves elsewhere? Douglas tried to get his attention. So did a couple others among them. Douglas kept trying to interrupt uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Mr. President, Johnson at one point said, I am not quite through. They sat back down. And he went on again at length. And he looked directly at Douglas, we're told, and said, have you ever lived on a plantation? He didn't know much about Douglas. Uh, I have, Your Excellency replies Douglas. And then as Douglas kept trying to engage him, Johnson kept ranting on about the war of races that's bound to come if you keep at this. And then he laid on him really his favorite political idea, which was states' rights. That if there ever to be any rights for your people, it has to be done willingly by the states, which means the southern states. And then he asks them, he says, is there anything wrong, quote, or unfair about that? Douglas raised his hand and said, uh, yes, sir, there is something wrong about that. But it all fell apart at that point. Uh, they were trying to, you know, trying to get the floor. Douglas kept, keeps trying to respond. We're told in like the last five or seven minutes, it just kind of fell into chaos. And then Douglas invited his group to stand and simply leave. And they did. But as they were leaving the room, Andrew Johnson was overheard saying, and it was recorded, quote, those damn sons of bitches thought they had me in a trap. I know that damn Douglas. He's just like any N-word, and he would sooner cut a white man's throat than not. That was the President of the United States with a group of respectful African-American leaders in the midst of that hothouse of early Reconstruction. Now, I just want to uh, wrap that up by saying what Frederick Douglass did next is what Douglass so often did. First, they went back to a hotel where the whole group of them prepared a manifesto that was then the next day published in, the, in, a, news, in a DC newspaper, saying what had happened how they had advocated for their civil and political rights before the president and he had humiliated and denounced them. 
But then he went a step further. He did what he always did, and maybe it's a, like a lot of you or a lot of us. He went to his desk and wrote a new speech. Douglas wrote millions of words. In fact, the reason we're here at all, it, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Douglas's words. He is his words. It's the only power he ever had, the only weapon he ever really had. He went to his desk and he prepared a new speech to take on the road because he didn't really know what he thought often until he got to his desk to write it down. I used to, I used to even do outlines of letters to my mother. I mean, I just didn't know what I was going to say. <laughs> Yeah, I quit that after a while. The new speech he called, Sources of Danger to the Republic. Now, no one knows where Reconstruction's going yet. That spring and summer, the Congress, under the uh, radical Republican leadership, is going to pass the first Civil Rights Act in American history. Um, it's going to pass uh, the 14th Amendment by uh, June of 66. That great section one of the 14th Amendment, which may be the single part of our Constitution that to this very day as we breathe is probably holding us together. Absent of section one of the 14th Amendment, would this society hold together? Due process of law, birthright citizenship, and equal protection? Bets are off. No one knows where Reconstruction is going yet, but he takes this speech on the road. He gives it all across the country in the winter, the spring, throughout the summer, into the fall of 1866. It's brilliant in some ways, but he also lost his bearings in this speech. It shows the desperation of a Frederick Douglass at this moment of Reconstruction because he looked at Andrew Johnson and he thought, Andrew Johnson has now the power, and he certainly had the will, and he has the power to completely ruin the possibilities of emancipation, the possibilities of the beginnings of black equality, of the right to vote, of civil rights, of access to education and security. He went on the road and just skewered Andrew Johnson. Day after day, dozens and dozens of times he gave this speech. He called Johnson, quote, an unmitigated calamity and a disgrace to the country under which we must stagger. The president. Then he went overboard. Our man wasn't perfect. He recommended three constitutional amendments. Eliminate the presidential veto. Not a good idea. Johnson was already vetoing everything Congress passed. Did Andrew Johnson will issue more vetoes in his first year and a half in the presidency than all previous presidents put together. Two, eliminate the presidential pardon power. Because Andrew Johnson was pardoning all kinds of ex-Confederates. Well, have a constitutional amendment get rid of the pardon power. He hadn't thought that one through either. And then third, he really lost it. Uh, constitutional amendment to eliminate the vice presidency. <laughs> and he wasn't being ironic and funny with these. Uh, this, was, this was desperation in him. And I can't explain it. I'm not going to defend it. Uh, none of this ever happened, of course. And I think he wised up that it didn't make great sense. But then he said this in that speech. A kind of a maxim that he ends the speech with. He says, quote, our government may at some time be in the hands of a bad man. No, don't laugh yet. When in the hands of a good man, it is all well enough. We ought to have our government so shaped, though, that even when in the hands of a bad man, we will be safe. I'm just saying. <laughs> Just a couple last thoughts. You know, are our structures sufficient to sustain us, whoever holds the presidency? We're living a moment where we're asking that. Uh, just a few last thoughts, and then we can get to our conversation. 
We're here because of words, as I said. Douglas wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography. His autobiography, especially the first two, are, some, are, are a couple of the greatest works in the memoir genre ever by an American. He wrote thousands of speeches. And by the way, every major Douglas speech exists in a text. He wasn't just the preacher from the sermonic tradition who could go into a hall and blow out the lights off the top of his head. He wrote them down. He would often stray from his text. He wrote one novella in 1852, The Heroic Slave, and he mastered the short-form political editorial in 16 years of his anti-slavery newspaper. He was a writer. He became really the prose poet of American democracy, the prose poet of the possibilities of American democracy. With unsurpassed eloquence, he explained the nature of slavery, its physical, but especially its mental potential to damage the soul. He expressed with terrible honesty and at times a savage irony, both the power of America's creeds, and he loved the Declaration of Independence, the first principles, the power of America's creeds and the hypocrisy with which his country contradicted and denied them. And make no mistake, it was always his country. Douglas was a radical patriot. To see or hear Frederick Douglass in the 19th century became a kind of wonder of the American world. And I speculate in the book that perhaps, and no one can ever measure this, that quite likely more people heard Frederick Douglass speak than any other person in the 19th century in an age with no microphones. He was a woman's rights man in an age when not many were. <laughs> Even though he got into a horrible tangle with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony over the 15th Amendment. He could be a radical thinker about some subjects, and he was. But he was also, in every way, an advocate of a kind of political liberalism. He believed in institutions. He wanted them to work. He believed in politics. He believed in voting as the answer to almost everything. He probably overbelieved in it. At times, he both loved and hated his country. He strongly believed in self-reliance for his fellow black people or anyone else. At the same time, he fiercely fought for an activist, interventionist government to free slaves defeat the Confederacy, and protect black citizens against terror and discrimination. He was both a big government thinker and a believer in self-reliance. Why can't you be both? He forged a hard-earned pragmatism out of political experience of disappointment, despair, and a few tremendous victories. He had a learned pragmatism. It came out of a difficult road. He was fundamentally not a self-made man, despite all the claims, particularly today, by the American right, that he was this great self-made man, and sometimes claims by himself. His speech called Self-Made Man was one of his most famous speeches. But often people only read the title of that. They don't bother to read the text. He seized the King James language of the Bible and used it to deliver the most enduring critique of slavery, the coming of disunion, the Civil War, emancipation, reconstruction, and beyond that any American fashion. There was always for Douglas a moral purpose for his politics. And I have a feeling that's why he's had so much resonance in recent months, not just because I wrote a book on it, but people are yearning for some kind of moral backbone in politics. <laughs>
the last sentence of his long form masterpiece, which was his second, and I'll end with this, which, which was his second autobiography entitled My Bondage and My Freedom. It's the autobiography that is not as widely read because it's 440 pages. And the first autobiography is only 125 pages. We teach the narrative. We tell everybody to read Bondage and Freedom. But by, when he came to the end of that, that autobiography that he plants right in the middle of the 1850s, in the middle of the political crisis over slavery, and he had to think up an ending sentence. He said, I will never forget my humble origins, and as long as heaven allows me to do this work, I will do it with my voice, my pen, and my vote. That's about all any of us have. Unless you have great wealth, after Citizens United anyway, what do we have? A voice, a pen, and a vote. Thank you. Uh, David, it's, it's such an honor and now going to be a pleasure to have a conversation. As I said to David beforehand, this is the first time we've met, but I feel like I've really come to know him first, having read the whole book, which is extraordinary. It's more than a history of Douglas. He's convinced it, me he really did. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it goes from his birth in 1818, so Thomas Jefferson's still alive, until the end of the 1800s. Um, and you, you see not just American, but European history. I learned more about uh, the Irish famine than I knew, th uh, thanks to reading the book again, proving that I read it. Um, so what we, we talked about with David and Larisha is to, uh, and David preempted this by going to one of the three, to talk about three presidents, um, and then talk about uh, and have Larisha help lead us in some of the issues that are running through not just Douglas's life, but the country's life at this time. Um, and if we have more time, we can talk about some other presidents. But let's start with Lincoln. Um, they only meet three times, right. yet the relationship um, is uh, at least a half decade, if not a decade in the making, and extends afterwards mm. for some time. Tell us about mm. Douglas and Lincoln. Well, they, they did meet only three times. August of 1863 was the first. Uh, Douglas went to Washington on his own, first time he'd ever been to Washington, D.C. He went to protest the discriminations, uh, particularly unequal pay, against black soldiers. He just got in line at the White House, you know, the famous lines in the Lincoln White House. Uh, he had no appointment. He just said, let me in. Gave his card. Lincoln let him in. They met for maybe a half hour, possibly 45 minutes. They had, as the diplomats always say, a uh, useful exchange of ideas, uh, but not a, they didn't agree on a lot. But I don't want to belabor this, but Douglas did go back after that, and in speeches, he would say things like, I felt big there. Sounds like a kid, you know. He was awed by Lincoln. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, he also said he'd never, uh, and he may have been may have been some hyperbole in this, but he said he'd never been with an important, powerful white man who treated him with such respect. Now, he says that at a time when he still really needs Lincoln. <laughs> so, second time they meet is August of 64. During Lincoln's re-election campaign and during the horrible stalemate of the war in the summer of 1864, this time he has an invitation. Lincoln invites him because he needs the most important black spokesman in America. He needs Douglas on his side. He, wa he tried to convince Douglas to be the leading agent of a bizarre scheme. This Lincoln looked Douglas in the eye and asked him to be the principal agent of a scheme that would funnel as many slaves out of the Upper South as possible before Election Day in November in case Lincoln loses the election, which was a very real likelihood in mid-August of 64. Douglas gets saved from that by the fall of Atlanta <laughs> about a week later or 10 days later and by uh, Farragut taking Mobile Bay in the biggest naval battle of the war. Uh, the war changes in the next like two weeks and that scheme was never put in place. 
The third meeting is Inauguration Day, second inauguration. Douglas is in the audience. He's right down to Lincoln's left. If you see the famous photograph of Lincoln giving the second inaugural, Douglas is down in the audience to Lincoln's left. He just went to Washington and decided, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to hear this speech. Now, he didn't, he didn't read the speech. He couldn't have beforehand. He later committed virtually all of the second inaugural to memory, and he would quote it at great length in speeches. But then he got in line and followed the presidential carriage back up Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House for a big reception that evening. Just got in line, he had no invitation again, just got in line, said, I want to come. You can't come, sir. Please stop him. Tell, according to Douglas, he said, tell the president Frederick Douglass is out here. Two minutes later, they come out, they get him, and they take him in. And in the East Room, they have this encounter, uh, which, Douglas is our principal source for this, but there, there's at least one other major eyewitness to this. So it did happen in some form. He claims Doug, Lincoln came across the room past all the visitors and the crowd and comes up to Douglas and says, Mr. Douglas, I want to know what you thought of my speech. Oh, Mr. President, uh, you know, attend to all of your guests. It doesn't matter what I thought. No, Douglas, I want to know what you think. And Douglas tells us that he told the president, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. And if you've read the second inaugural, it's, it's essence, it's biblical, it's essence is authentic tragedy. It's essence is in the long middle paragraph, not in the last paragraph about healing and charity, which we so often quote. It's essence is in the middle where he says every drop of Blood shed by the lash shall be paid by blood shed by the sword. Uh, Douglas had spent uh, three years, four years of the war uh, wishing he could write that speech for Lincoln. But uh, the fact that Lincoln had written it was pretty important. There would have been a fourth meeting um, because Lincoln invited Douglas to have tea at the soldier's home uh, in late April. Uh, Soldier's Home is that, is that place in Washington that's about a half hour carriage ride from the White House, higher ground, cooler air. But Douglas had to turn it down because they had a speaking engagement, couldn't come to Washington, and they did not have tea. Uh, that would have been a much longer meeting probably, and who knows what would have come of it. But to finally shut up about this, uh, Douglas fashioned numerous kinds of Lincoln the rest of his life. He actually created about three different kinds of Lincoln for different occasions and different audiences for different needs. Um, in fact, the, the second greatest speech of Douglas's life after his 4th of July speech of 1852 is the speech Douglas gives dedicating that Freedman's Memorial in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C., the Standing Lincoln Kneeling Slave Monument. That is one of Douglas's greatest works of rhetoric. It's a courageous work of rhetoric. You opened the book with it. I opened the book with it. It's been 10 pages opening the book with it. I, I feared I'd just lose my reader there, but apparently they stayed for page 11. <laughs> so anyway, it's a fraught relationship because Douglas was a ferocious critic of Lincoln in the first year and a half of the war. Um, but a little bit like John Brown, uh, Douglas made the utmost of the dead Lincoln, the martyred Lincoln. Well, that's a good segue to um, my interest in what you portray in the book. Um, I'm not sure you quite put it this way. Actually, I think at one point you do invoke Hegel, um, a series of dialectics mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. Douglas himself embodies. Mm -hmm. And in the story that you just told, um, I think it highlights several of those dialectics of Lincoln, excuse me, of Douglas, vis-a-vis um, -vis Lincoln in that particular moment. Um, the specific critique in that speech was he was preeminently the white man's president, mm -hmm. entirely devoted to the welfare of the white man. And he goes on to talk about, um, talk to um, his white fellow citizens and states, you are the children of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. We, invoking the black public that was there, are at best only his stepchildren. Children by adoption, 
children by forces of circumstances and necessity. So can you talk about those various tensions um, that you see in the kind of Jeremiad, Jeremiad kind mm -hmm. of prophetic mm -hmm. nature mm -hmm. of Douglas um, that we know, but also this pragmatic political character that you portray in the book? Uh, well, thank you for pointing to that speech. It gave me a chance to come back to it. <laughs> uh, it, it. It is a dialectical speech. It's also, of course, as usual, Douglas, the ferocious iron ironist. Um, he does say, and you gotta remember, th this statue has just been unveiled by President Grant. Douglas has the most extraordinary audience he'd ever had. He has the entire government in front of him. Grant's cabinet, Supreme Court, members of Congress, they're all there. Uh, he could have done a kind of just an occasional, he could have done a celebratory speech and everybody cheers, the band plays and they go home. He says, my white fellow citizens, you are Abraham Lincoln's children. I and my people are only his stepchildren. He was a white man's president. Um, Sounds like Kanye West or something. Yes. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's almost bitter in the way that he, and, and, he, and he quite specifically remembers what Lincoln's positions were in the first year of the war. He was going to send back all fugitive slaves. The war was not going to be a war against slavery. His hesitancy about the border states, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in the middle of this speech, which is not very long, this is barely a 20-minute speech, which is short for Douglas, he pauses. There's a, there's a pause. You can just feel it. And the second half of the speech is a different Lincoln. He says he was not our president until he was. And the second half of the speech has a refrain, just like the stepchild metaphor in the first. The second half of the speech, the refrain is, under his rule and in due time, under his rule and in due time, he does it three times, under his rule and in due time, we became free. He admits, this is 1876 now, this is the 11th anniversary of the Lincoln assassination. It's also the year, I mean, the context is everything here. It's the year of the U.S. centennial. It's this election, this hugely important election year of 1876. Reconstruction has fallen to pieces. That speech was a reconstruction speech. That speech is him warning the government, or they're right in front of him. Grant, cabinet, Congress, Supreme Court, reconstruction's dying. You barely have any time left to save it. What are you going to do? But then he uses Lincoln to say, Lincoln's caution, Lincoln's pace toward emancipation, Douglas actually admits was probably the only way it could come. And I'm not sure he liked making that admission, but he did it. And, and to me, that speech has always been so great because it's so honest both parts of it. And he didn't just give some throwaway celebration speech. He was always doing these you know, juxtapositions, these uh, uh, literary critics always call it binaries, you know. Uh, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. Oppositions, Douglas was, well most great rhetoric does that. Uh, it gives you this and gives you that. Uh, takes you here and takes you there uh, with, with language, but he was a genius at that. And I looked in vain, by the way, in Grant's papers to find out, what did Grant think of that speech? Uh, he must have gone back to the White House and taken a nap. I mean, <laughs> because I couldn't find a shred anywhere. Why didn't he go back and write down what he, whatever he thought, why didn't he? Because he didn't. He didn't. Probably went and had a drink. So let's talk about Grant. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, was your that was your lead in, right? There, uh, Grant. Yeah, t yeah t tell, tell us a little bit about Grant and uh, and Douglas, obviously, the, the Johnson presidency is more than a setback on, um, yeah. on Lincoln's reconstruction efforts. And yet, uh, after um, the impeachment and near removal, um, it sets the stage for Grant to be elected. Yeah. Um, what, what does Douglas think of Grant? Uh, he actually uh, greatly admired Grant. Uh, he politically admired Grant. He was utterly loyal to Grant both times, 68 and 72, for political reasons to some extent. Uh, 
he also, I think, greatly admired Grant for the same reasons so many other people did. He was this general who had won this horrific war. Um, but he admired Grant mostly because Grant was the center of this Republican Party that for Douglas now became his political home. He had no other political home. And he came to realize that Grant was at least to an extent the real thing. He was always for emancipation, <sighs> although there are slips along the way in the way refugee slaves got handled during the war, but we can't hold you know, Grant responsible for all of that horror. Um, and Grant did, in his first term, go after the Ku Klux Klan. No question about it. Uh, Grant, the, Grant, the first Grant administration drove the original Ku Klux Klan out of business. Um, their problems, though, were that Grant in the first term did appoint Douglas as part of the Santa Domingo Commission. Now, he wasn't an actual commissioner. The Santa Domingo Commission was this group. Uh, there were five commissioners, and Douglas was sent along as the secretary, recorder, and so forth. Kind of an underling role, but, but he it, took it. It is the first formal government position he takes. Exactly. And they go to Santo Domingo, which is today the Dominican Republic, that island, big island. And the idea was to annex Santo Domingo and to try to prepare the way for it. And the, the journey was almost three months on the USS Tennessee, and Douglas is part of this. He kept a diary then, which is very interesting. When he came back, Grant had a big dinner at the White House for his Santo Domingo commission and didn't invite Douglas. It was a snub, the press picked it up, Douglas had to keep saying, oh no, I didn't feel snubbed too much. Um, so he had that difficult. He was never close to Grant, never had the kind of personal chats with Grant that he will actually have later with Hayes, uh, and even to a certain extent with Garfield, uh, who he gets his first two big appointments from. Uh, Grant kept his distance from Douglas uh, politically. But when it came to the 1872 re-election, and there was this big movement to dump Grant, the, the so-called liberal Republican movement, Douglas was steadfast for Grant. Uh, and he broke with his old great friend, Charles Sumner, who opposed Grant. That's a complicated political story. But Douglas always honored Grant in retrospect, you know, after Grant had died. Uh, Grant's symbol as you know, savior of the Union, was really equal to Lincoln's in these years uh, in terms of the symbolic uh, power of his presence. Now, and, and, and interestingly, Douglas almost never commented on the scandals of the Grant administration, terrible scandals. He just left it be, like he didn't want to go there, didn't want to tarnish Grant. The Republican Party is the only home Douglas ever saw himself having. He once said famously, uh, the Republican Party is our ship, all else is the sea. Uh, he was probably right about that, but it got harder and harder and harder to stay loyal. Uh, anyway, but they were never really close. Uh, would that they might have been. So in, the, in this relationship, this developing kind of um, political abolitionism and then um, in his role in founding the Second Republic of mm -hmm. the United States, mm -hmm. um, Douglas shifts in his life from being the consummate outsider, yeah. um, as prophets are always on the margins, right? right. Um, They're supposed to, to be. Right, <laughs> by definition. It's in their job description. By definition, <laughs> to being inside yeah. um, on this yeah. expedition um, not to call it not not uh, to export uh, deport uh, black Americans if you will but certainly this annexation project yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he finds himself on the inside of power so can you talk about um, that tension how you explored that throughout the book right. um, and how that also affected, you talk a lot of times about his psyche, um, because another feature of prophets is they are men of sorrows. Yeah. Um, the weight of the world is on their shoulders. Yeah. Um, there's a sense of, you know, kind of 
piercing, um, this piercing quality into the injustice of the world, mm -hmm. that um, pressing immediatism. Um, but government is slow. Mm -hmm. And certainly mm -hmm. by design, the US mm -hmm. government is slow. Um, so how does he in his body and in his mm -hmm. politics and in his American kind of radical reformist tradition yeah. reconcile those tensions? He didn't always mm -hmm. reconcile them. Um, you can tell Larisha comes out of religious studies tradition, yeah. and I love that. Black church. I love guilty. this. Well, I love this. No, not guilty. <laughs> In a it, good way. Guilty. It is the appropriate for Douglas. <laughs> yes, because it is the path to understanding this man. Mm -hmm. He is so steeped in the Bible, so steeped, especially in the Old Testament, so steeped in Old Testament storytelling from Exodus on. Um, that he can't fashion a speech without some kind of biblical passage or rhetoric or reference, and sometimes just literal quotations. Now, uh, but I loved you bringing up the old outsider who becomes the insider, because I did make that one of the backbone themes of the book. It, it just is. I mean, actually, I think Douglas is our historical prototype for this. Think of all the people in our own lifetime who at one point in their lives are a radical outsider, a radical reformer, always on the outside of power, beating on the doors, demanding the government or power structures give in. Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Well, you know, the community organizer who becomes president of the United States, for God's sake. You know. But think of John Lewis, you know, who's now got pancreatic cancer. God bless him. Hang on, John. Uh, think of, of Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, mm -hmm. worked for a, you know, a, a, a violent, uh, radical organization, comes out and becomes president of his country and tries to be its heel. And there's zillions of others. Think of all the civil rights leaders who became mayors and congressmen and senators, and now they're inside of power. Now they're dealing with the nitty gritty, ugly stuff of building an airport, you know, or getting better <laughs> sewer systems, and, and on and on and on. This is Douglas after the war. And it turns out that's fascinating. That's not just, uh, you know, stuff you don't want to look at. He loved getting his federal appointments. Um, he loved the prestige of that. I never quite understood until I got into all these newspaper sources of just how important his appointment as Marshal of the District of Columbia was in the black community. Whoa, the respect that meant in the black community. It meant he was kind of a glorified sheriff of the District of Columbia. And then when he becomes recorder of deeds, it meant he's the person who runs the office that records all the real estate transactions. And he got eight appointments of clerks, first four of which were his four adult children. <laughs> and he gets accused of nepotism all over the press in Washington. Now today you couldn't get away with that. Um, but seriously, it, but one of the things that radical outsider who becomes a political insider does have to refashion, if not really compromise, is his apocalyptic, biblical, millennial vision of history and of change and of people. It's harder and harder to make that case during Reconstruction, although he never totally relinquished, relinquished relinquishes it, and we see it at the very end of his life when his last great speech is all about lynching. Uh, a Jeremiah, if ever there was one. Um. Let's go to the audience for questions. Fred Hitt. I'm just intrigued by your description of all of the ways Oh, if you could wait for the microphone so the folks on the video can hear you. I'm just intrigued by the way that you set up these situations where Douglas is making manifest his his opposition to what's going on not only in the presidency but in it why was he not assassinated why was he not taken mm. out by the bad guys mm -hmm. thank you uh, I've been asked that many times and I've tried to come up with a better answer um, he was attacked many times I'll give you one straight quick answer and it may not satisfy but people didn't carry guns that much in the 19th you might not believe this but at a rally an anti-slavery rally in 1840s 1850s out in Ohio or all across the north 
there might be opposition. In fact, there could be even sometimes violent opposition. Lots of things were thrown at abolitionists. <laughs> Douglas had a small pig thrown at him once <laughs> in a church right up on the altar. And I was a badge of honor. It was the brick bats. You, want, you, you know, that could, they could kill you. Eggs, tomatoes, stuff thrown at them. And actually, frankly, he learned this from William Lloyd Garrison and, and other abolitionists. One of the purposes, in, in the early years, the 1840s into the 50s, one of the purposes of an abolitionist gathering, especially a big rally, is if you had opposition, and some, a lot of people came to these to just, you know, heckle the speakers. You wanted that. You wanted to stimulate opposition. You wanted to stimulate anger. Because then it might stimulate your supporters who were kind of lukewarm, they just came to see what this is about, to defend you. Uh, they often walked away proud if they got attacked. However, he got attacked and almost killed in Pendleton, Indiana in 1843. A huge mob attacked this makeshift stage out in a field and it ended up in a total brawl with everyone beating each other up with chairs and the rest. Douglas broke his wrist in the fight and he was saved. He always gave credit to this abolitionist named White, William White, for saving his life, for dragging him literally out of the mob into the back of some carriage and out of the woods. Um, why wasn't he shot? I, I don't know. Uh, he was thrown off trains. He was attacked uh, in hotels at times, uh, verbally attacked more than physically attacked. He was a big man. But I do think you have to understand that people didn't come to rallies necessarily with guns. They, they had hunting rifles back on their farms. Um, but don't think he wasn't attacked. Uh, oh, and there were, there were death threats in the mail. Uh, lots of those, letters. Uh, Yeah. Uh, integration change to find some way to stop this voice that is so articulate yeah. and perennial. Uh, well, they sometimes tried. The last he, had fear of, he had fear of traveling in the South. Oh, yes. He, didn't, he never went South until after the war. Um, yeah, but, he, but even after the war, if I remember correctly, there were a few instances where yes. he was... Uh, yes quite careful where he went and how he traveled and all of that. He was, although he went into the Deep South. In fact, I learned a lot from that Evans collection about this. I, I, did not, I had not realized how many different places Douglas had gone in the Deep South in the 1880s and early 90s. He did a tour all the way down the eastern seaboard. Well, he went by boat to Charleston, and then he went through Savannah, and then down through southern Georgia to Jacksonville, Florida for a kind of small world's fair they were holding in Jacksonville. And I, I, got, I have press accounts of town by town by town. And in some of these places in rural Georgia, with audiences of former freedmen, ex-slaves, according to the press, he would speak in a dialect, a, a southern dialect. Uh, he was quite a performer. He could do accent. He loved to perform in his Scottish accent, too, but apparently wasn't that, <laughs> he wasn't that good at it. But, um, Sid Milkis, up here in the front. Uh, Sorry, I didn't see you back there. And then we'll go to the back. Okay. Uh, thank you for this uh, really great conversation. Uh, I wanted to ask you, David, to talk uh, about Douglas's great July 4th oration sure. of 1852, because there's also a dialectical quality to that that myself and my students really uh, appreciate. You uh, teach that speech? I, I sure do, yeah. Lots of people do now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and the, the way he calls, um, he, he uh, denounces the, the celebration as kind of hypocrisy. Right. Um, and then goes on to sort of talk about the importance uh, yeah. of July 4th. And it, there's a very different tone than there is to Garrison, who will burn the Constitution right. at July 4th uh, celebration. So I just would like to hear your, your sense of that speech. And what was the reaction of his denouncing Mm -hmm. uh, the, the North as well as the South. And I think the speech was in Rochester. It was in Rochester uh, and Corinthian North Hall. North and the South for this hypocrisy. Yeah, on the 5th of July, 1852, uh, 600 people attended. 
primarily an audience of his friends. But uh, uh, my quick take on that speech, it's, it's the rhetorical masterpiece of, of, Amer of abolitionism and maybe of American letters. Uh, I mean, there are a few other things by Emerson and a few others that match it, but it's like a symphony in three movements. I know symphonies generally have four movements, I'm told, but this one had three. The first movement is about six to seven pages where he honors the founding fathers. He calls the Declaration the ring bolt of your independence. It's beautiful. He puts them at ease. This glorious day, this glorious republic. The founders were geniuses. Um, then about six pages in, he starts to, to really rain down the pronoun you and your and you and your uh, on his audience. And then comes a pause, and it's as though, I don't know if he did it, but it's as though he hammered down on the lectern, and he says, pardon me. Why have you invited me to speak on your 4th of July? And then comes that famous passage. The 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, but I must mourn, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, but what this day needs, and, and, and his voice you can almost feel is, is changing here. The cadences are getting louder and angrier. And by the way, he had a full text in front of him. This, this baby was written in a text, and he already had it printed up for sale. <laughs> no, our man was a marketer. 50 cents, you could get them in the newspaper, you could get them for $10 for 100 or I forget what it was. Anyway, but then the second movement of the speech, the long middle section of a symphony, is this cacophony of horror everything from the hold of slave ships to slave auction blocks to the selling away of children from their mothers to the blood on slaves backs it's it, uh, it's just horrific and it goes on for like 10 pages it's like a hailstorm he said and, and he starts that by saying what this day needs is sacrilegious irony and i'm going to give it to you and there's like two uses of isaiah in there and that section ends with a Jonathan Edwards moment. He says, for the love of God, there is a reptile coiled at your nation's heart. <laughs> fling it away, fling it away, fling it away. It is about to kill you. And then there's another pause. And he spends the last like four pages, five of the speech, letting the audience back up. It's like he's handed out towels they can dry off. <laughs> and he says, uh, your nation is young. It's still malleable. There's still the possibility that you may have time. And then he quite almost unbelievably ends with that hymn. It's actually a, a poem by William Lloyd Garrison. Go sound the jubilee. Um, but in the, as you suggest here, though, you can't have missed in this speech, though it is a blistering uh, attack on the hypocrisy of this country, it is an embrace of the principles of the Declaration of Independence as creeds that belong to humankind. And they don't belong to any one people, they belong to all people. Uh, but you're denying them. Uh, fling that reptile from your heart, it's eating you up. He doesn't call it slavery, he doesn't need to. He's too good at this to have to do that. Um, I don't know how that audience responded. I'd give anything, you know, to have. Um, but there were about 600 people in that hall that day. But he went right out on the road. Selling copies of it. <laughs> That's why there's so many in the libraries to this day. Lots of communities read it now on the 4th of July around the country. It's, we had a reading, we do a reading at the Beinecke Library at Yale now. We have like six different people read parts of it. One year they let me read the ending. <laughs> I told them I wanted the reptile part, but they, <laughs> they didn't give me that part. <laughs> Margaret, in the back. In the recent film, Harriet, uh, 
Yes. There are some scenes with other abolitionists, and uh, Frederick Douglass is there. Yeah. And it made me wonder, can you say something more about the relationship between Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass? There wasn't a very, ex I'm, I, I hate to disappoint, but there wasn't a very extensive relationship between them. They were both from the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, she was in the county south. He was from Talbot County. She was from uh, Dorchester County, south of him. Uh, they escape at, at different times, very different times. Uh, they met. They knew one another. Uh, there is one extraordinary letter that he writes to her, uh, admiring her, giving her all the credit in the world for, for her bravery. Far braver than me, he says, are you, General Tubman. Um, now, as you may know, Harriet Tubman remained illiterate, so there, can't, there aren't any letters from her to him. Uh, and she moves eventually, not only to upstate New York, but then on to Canada and St. Catharines uh, in the 1850s, and lived out most of her life. Then she comes back and lives in upstate New York. Um, that scene in the film, in the Harriet, I liked the Harriet film, by the way. I, I was told by my historian friends I wasn't going to like it. I actually liked it. Um, that's a ridiculous scene where Douglas <laughs> appears. It just it didn't happen, but it, you know, there's all, in every good history, even when a history film comes across well and good, they got to invent something that just makes no sense at all. But that's all right. I thought that film at least put flesh and blood on this, you know, remarkably mythic figure of Harriet Tubman. It really did. Because most of that's true. I mean, we don't know everything about how she got all these people out, but she got a heck of a lot of people out, particularly from Maryland. Isn't, and is there some story in your book about how his sons, oh, yeah. when they engage in the war, oh, do yeah. they, they don't actually go with her to the South, but there's a no, near... Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful letter from Lew her son Lewis is in the 54th Massachusetts, the famous black regiment that storms uh, Fort Wagner uh, in July 1863. But in one of Lewis, Lewis wrote a lot of letters from the front. They're fantastic. Many of them to his girlfriend, uh, who he's, it took, her, took her years to say yes. But, um, but he writes to his father at one point and says, Father, we're, we're getting closer and closer to the enemy, and I saw Harriet Tubman. Because she was down in, in Beaufort, in Hilton Head Island, and she, was, she led a gunboat up to Combahee River uh, in, in attacks on, on Confederate uh, strongholds. But the fact that Lewis would write to his father, hey, I saw Harriet Tubman, so man. Cool. You, had, you didn't see her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a kind of a cool thing. I think we've got time for one more question. There's a hand up in the back. I was just uh, in the overflow room and two observations in my question, and that is that um, I wish the, uh, the great Miller Center production people could be doing the impeachment. It's so much better. <laughs> the proceeds of seeing it out here in the, the impeachment hearings are better. The impeachment than this? hearings are the, t oh. the this is far better technically and more interesting. Than oh, what we I see. see. On the impeachment hearing. I thought Not we were getting the bad review, didn't you? And, <laughs> and also that no, that, they don't have the cutaway cameras at impeachment. Oh, I see. You're only I, seeing that's right. You're only, you only seeing get, the speakers. You only you're get the top of Adam Schiff's yeah, head. Is what you <laughs> Yeah. And maybe uh, your next career is being an audio stunt double for uh, Harrison Ford. Oh. But you, I don't know if that's... Um, I actually you, prefer the Garrison Keillor comparisons, but that's <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, you mentioned media. Um, not that you would have a whole lot of input when Hollywood gets a hold of the material, but... No, I have none. What would be your no. highlighted, don't omit, or this is what we would love to see either corrected or established in the minds of the viewers? Well, I am working relatively closely with the screenwriter. He's a man named Kevin Wilmot, who's a brilliant guy. He wrote the screenplay for Spike Lee's last film called Black Klansman. He's also done a variety of other good films, documentaries in particular. He wrote, he, Directed, wrote, produced, created a documentary called CSA, which is kind of a cult film. 
it's based on the premise that the Confederacy wins the Civil War and what oh, happens. Yeah. It's an incredible, crazy film. He made that about 15 years ago. Kevin is really smart, mm -hmm. deeply historical guy, but he's also keeping his distance. He's read the book carefully, and the truth is, that's art. That's, he's writing a fiction. A screenplay, even you know, based on a book, is still a fiction. It has to be. It slices, it's pieces. I have all kinds of episodes in Douglas's life I hope get into this. I, I don't know yet. He hasn't shown me his first draft yet. I don't even know if he will. Um, I'll give you a mundane example of a scene I, I, ho I hope and pray gets in. It may not. But in Rosetta Douglas's reminiscence, she wrote about her mother. That's their daughter, their oldest child, Rosetta, wrote a reminiscence of her mother after both her parents were dead. It's so called Aunt, Anna Douglas, the, uh, Frederick's wife. For Fre Frederick's wife, first, first wife. wife of 44 years. And Rosetta wrote this piece called My Mother As I Recall Her. It's actually fascinating. It's very revealing. And her mother remained illiterate all of her life. Douglas's wife of 44 years did not read or write. But there's an, a moment in this reminiscence where she says, but mother loved the occasions when father would gather us all around the dinner table when the children were, were young. And, we would, and he would choose a biblical piece and we would all read sections in the order Mother couldn't read them, but she loved hearing us read. I want that to be a scene. I want Douglas directing his children and reading, I don't know, whatever, some passage from Isaiah, and Anna listening and admiring the voices of her children. I want that love, that, that pain and love of that family to come out in those kinds of settings. I could give you a hundred other ones. I, I, want, I want the scene where Douglas returns from England after he's fled after the John Brown raid, because uh, he has to, he was almost captured, he would have been hanged with Brown. He flees out through Canada, he goes to England, he spends seven months there, speaking all over the British Isles, and then he gets the news that his daughter Annie had died of diphtheria at age 11, namesake of Anna, and he immediately heads for Liverpool and takes the first ship home, not knowing if it's safe for him to come home or not. He comes in through Canada, comes to Rochester. We don't know what happened, but a screen, screenwriters love it when they ask you, what do we know about this moment? And when you say, really nothing, they say, good. <laughs> <laughs> because they can make it up, so why not? <laughs> Douglas comes to the door. Anna says, I don't know. You want to see the grave? And she takes him out to the grave. And then Kevin can do whatever he wants with that. But I, 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 there are all kinds of play. I can't do that in my book, but Kevin, the screenwriter can. I mean, go for it, buddy, you know. Uh, I don't care if the meetings with Lincoln are in there or not, in a way. People kind of know that. And I'm afraid Lincoln would dominate. I don't know. There's a lot of other things I hope are in there. Uh, maybe some moment with John Brown where they look each other in the eye and Douglas realizes, I can't go with this man. <laughs> um, so. Well, David, um, I started by saying that I, I feel like I've known you. Um, actually, being here on stage with you has been just such a great pleasure. Um, I realize that you're not Garrison Keillor, you're Robin Williams. There's a brilliance. <laughs> there is a brilliance to your, um, your I was going to say performance, but it's more than that. It's, it's storytelling in the Demands. best sense of what history is, which is um, bringing us back to uh, an important life, but the important life of our country. And we're really, really honored and thankful that you came and shared it with us today. So thank you. My thrill. Thank you. Thank you. If, if you will, if you will, um, please let David go back first so that he can be in a position to sign books because
Uh, otherwise, people will come to the stage and stop him from doing that. He'll sign some books in the back. Um, and we thank you all and look forward to having you next Friday. I think our event is on China, uh, which is a look at the autonomy, or maybe not, of Hong Kong and Taiwan with Evan Feigenbaum, Shirley Lin, and Harry Harding. Thanks again to Christina, to Alfred, and all of our staff, and thanks to you all. So thank you.